Gracious Heavenly Father, I just ask your continued blessings upon these studies here in Revelation, that you would filter out all of that which is ignorant and foolish, but just seal to our hearts the truth of your word, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in the book of Revelation, and we're go getting ready to move into a chapter that is a little different than chapter 12. Now, as you know, I, I believe in the sovereignty of God and that the arrangement of these chapters, even though there were no chapter divisions in the original text, the, con the very construction uh, or arrangement of these chapters was sovereignly dictated by God. In chapter 12, it's hard not to see God's power and authority in that number 12. Now, I, I'm not, it's not my intention to make a big deal out of these numbers here, but, but we're getting ready to move into chapter 13, which is generally not a, a very good number. The beast that we're getting ready to look at is more than just the Antichrist, more than just a single individual. Uh, the Antichrist, which uh, is the head of the beast, it represents the final world empire that the Antichrist will be ruling over. Just a casual reading of Revelation chapter 13 will reveal some very st striking Im imagery, okay? Uh, frightening somewhat, uh, monstrous. Uh, these beasts are described as, as quite, uh, I'm looking for the right word here. Uh, it's, it's a monstrosity. This is going to be a very difficult chapter for me. Uh, so I ask you to bear with me here as we begin to look at chapter 13. But I want to say a few things uh, up front here before we get started. Now, I'm going to use a, I'm going to, I'm going to just let you know, I'm going to use a code word, okay, for, for this religion. You should see it here on the screen somewhere. I'm going to use a code word, and that uh, so so that when you hear me mention this word, you'll know that I'm talking about this. Uh, I'm just going to call it the counterfeit. I also want to say up front here that there are many many interpretations as to as to who or what this this last days end time. Uh, beast system is. I've made a number of videos on this, and uh, the subject, folks, itself is is quite uh, in depth. Okay, it's there's a lot there's a lot that could be looked at, and it's not my purpose to 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 go over past material to rehash. Uh, a lot of that here in this chapter. But just to say that, that most of you who have followed this channel, you know what my position is on the identity of that, of that last days, end times, antichrist system. Most of you know that the, the word Elohim, uh, the meaning is one God, one true God. That's our God. Now, when you compare that to this counterfeit, uh, the, the very name means submission. Now, of course, uh, submission itself is not a bad word. Uh, we are, we're to submit ourselves to God. But when it, when that, when we attach the word forced to that word submission, when we include the word uh, 
forced when it's a mandatory submission. Uh, when we talk about that, manda that submission being mandatory in our own uh, religious faith, Christianity, uh, we're looking at legalism in the extreme. Now, when we look at when, when we're looking at this counterfeit, its very name means submission. That's the 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 meaning of the word or the meaning of the name. And and I find it very interesting just to begin with that its very name means submission. But it's I want to point out that it's not a willing submission. It's not uh, by choice. It's mandatory. In fact, it's so mandatory that it's you submit or you die. Uh, I also want to point out that I find it interesting that just in the very name of this counterfeit, if we remember that Satan desires to be like God, that his whole reason, purpose for existing is to be like the great I Am, uh, you remember Moses asked God what his name was, and he said, I am that I am, the great I am. And so now, you, now we're, we're looking at this counterfeit, which is, that's exactly what this is, this, this religion, this counterfeit. If you break that word, just that word down, and again, I believe God is sovereign over letters as, as well as he is numbers, but if you break that down, this is what you you come up with. I'll put that up on the screen here. Uh, his claim to be that he is the I am. Now, of course, I, I, I played around with the, the letter L there and changed the L from a capital to a lower case, but I find that also interesting. But that's, that's really neither here nor there. Uh, what is important, I believe, at the outset to understand here about this is uh, considering that the fact that most of us are Westerners. We're not Middle Eastern. We weren't raised Middle Eastern. Uh, we grew up with Western values in, in a Western culture. We have a Western mindset, a Western way of thinking. And what we need to understand is, is that the Bible uh, is is Israel and Jerusalem centric? It's uh, and particularly prophecy is end times prophecy is Middle Eastern oriented. It's Middle Eastern centric. We tend to look at at these things from through the eyes of of a Westerner, when in fact we would do much better to look at it. Uh, as a Middle Easterner. That's another thing I want to point out. It's not Europe-centric. It's Middle Eastern-centric. So when Scripture talks about Greece or Rome, it, it refers to the Eastern empires which ruled over different places in the Middle East at, at one time. In verse 1, we're, we're going to read, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. The sea often represents multitudes of people. The beast will rise up out of a particular group of people. The seven heads represent seven major empires. Mountains are nations or, or empires. So we're looking at Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, uh, uh, Medo-Persia, Eastern Greece, Eastern Rome, and the counterfeit empire. The ten horns in this chapter, chapter 13, the ten horns represent the ten nation, nations 
or kingdoms which will rule over the final empire. The ten crowns will be the ten kings or the rulers over those ten nations. The name, uh, on, the name on, that's on the heads of the beast is against God in Christ, which is, is what makes it blasphemous. I believe this blasphemous name, okay, I believe the name to be, and I'm going to put it up on the screen here, this. This is what I believe the blasphemous name is. Meaning, greater than other gods, which is an affront to our true God. Uh, for he, he's claiming to be greater than the true God of Scripture. Now that that is also that that name is it's found almost uh, on almost every Muslim uh, country's uh, banner, crest, flag. This is why God describes it as written across the heads of the beast. This is not a fun subject to talk about for various reasons. Uh, I want to point out here that, as you know, it's the position of this ministry. We're not going to be here. So I can understand people saying, well, why should we even care? Uh, but I'll also submit to you that there's not a single verse, and a chapter or a verse in the Bible that doesn't have some uh, purpose, significance, uh, play some significant role or have some significance in our thinking as it concerns uh, everything that has to do with God and our relationship with Him. Uh, it makes no sense to look at some portion of Scripture and say, well, you know, it's because we're not in this or whatever, we ought to just skip over that and, and go on. If we're going to do that, then we might as well just skip the entire book of Revelation. We can find joy and peace and comfort in verses of Scripture in passages of Scripture which uh, tend to be a little bit depressing. And I don't see how anyone can cannot see uh, chapter 13 as something that quite horrific. But it's text that we have to deal with and uh, uh, I believe that a greater understanding of, of what is going on will will translate into a greater understanding of uh, a greater peace and rest in our lives as as believers. In verse two, now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Uh, the interpretation of the three animals are given in Daniel chapter 7. Leopard, uh, that's Greece, uh, the eastern section of the empire, which is Turkey, uh, Iraq, uh, the bear, um, that's, that's Medo-Persia, which is Iran, Kurdistan. The lion is Babylon, which is Iraq. Uh, the dragon is Satan. And these are all Middle Eastern Middle Eastern, uh, Arab, Turkish nations or kingdoms. No Europeans. You see no Europeans here. Now, that, folks, is, the, is a strong signal, okay, that it's a, it's a, it's a heads up, okay? It's God, I, I think, intends us for us to see that this is Middle Eastern centric, which makes all the sense in the world. Why would it not be? And so religious wise, they are all of this counterfeit religion. The beast is the empire of the devil, and that's where it gets all of its power and authority, okay, which is, I believe, contrasted with the 
the power and the authority we saw in chapter 12, which even is seen in the number 12. Uh, I, I could say a lot about 13. Uh, you know, I can just mention Judas uh, being the 13th, you know, number 13, Judas. I, I, can, I can go into the, launch into a, a whole long thing on the number 13, but that's not been my intention here. Uh, the uh, the beast that we're looking at is the empire of Satan. That's where it gets its its power, its authority, and it it is the tool that he uses on earth in the attempt to achieve his goal to be, which is what to be, to be like God, to be worshipped as God. In verse 3, we see, And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. Well, I can understand if a, you know, a single individual is shot in the head like JFK was and he came back to life, I can understand how the world would marvel and follow this individual. And many Christians have thought, you know, that that is referring to an individual. I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that there is strong evidence, strong, very strong evidence, that this deadly wound that is healed is not an individual, but a kingdom, an empire, the heads of the beast represent empires, and one of the empires is dealt a death blow, which is what it means to be mortally wounded, but then that wound is healed. I don't believe that's speaking of an individual or Satan who doesn't have any power over life and death. He doesn't have the power of resurrection. Only God has that power, okay? The Antichrist is only one part of Satan's system of government and religion. So one of the seven empires has already been dealt a death blow, and therefore it should have been gone forever. But instead, it'll be healed. That is, it'll be brought back to power again. Okay? If you jump over to Revelation chapter 17, it says, Here's the mind which has wisdom, the seven heads and are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And there are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. Of course, I hate jumping ahead, but the, the seven heads of the beast are seven empires. And in the time of John, in, in which this was written, Somewhere around 95 A.D., we're told that five of the empires have fallen. One is, and the other is not yet come. The, the other is yet future. And in 95 A.D., when John was writing this, Egypt, uh, Assyria, Babylonia, or Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece had already fallen. They had already been defeated. The one that was in power at the time was Rome, and the one that was yet to come in John's future was this counterfeit empire. Okay? The, if, if I just stopped right here and, and tried to get you people to think along the lines of, of not as much political, not as much uh, eth, eth, ethnic, uh, in, in ethnic terms, or political terms, but religious terms. Folks, this is a spiritual conflict that is between God, His one true religion, and the Antichrist system, which is what? Just political? Stop and think, folks. If Satan is going to counterfeit the one true God and one true religion, then he's going to go about it in a way that he, he's going to present it in a way, in a counterfeit way. Uh, 
I understand why so many want to just simply look at uh, some factions of Christianity as being that Antichrist system. Well, it's the Pope, it's the Vatican, it's Roman Catholicism, you know, that's religion. You know, at least they're leaning in the right direction. But in my opinion, and I'm not asking anybody to agree with me here, uh, in fact, it's it's. I advise you not to agree with me just because I believe something on anything. It's the weight of the evidence, and I've I've spent a lot of time looking at this. The weight of the evidence, okay, is that it is the what we're looking at is the church removed where the then dominant world religion is this counterfeit system okay it's number two right now you take us out of the way it's number one and that's number that's that's the that's number one number two is when when you want to talk about it militarily when you take away when you take the church out of the picture when you take and uh, possibly decimate uh America is a superpower. If if you just Google the the number the world's second largest army or military, and you'll see that it has connections to this counterfeit. Okay, number two, when number one goes, number two steps in. That's that is so that alone is is strong evidence for this. Of course, there is a ton of evidence supporting what I'm claiming here. You just you'd have to you'd have to just spend time looking at it. Uh, and we know that there was one man who started this counterfeit religion, the seventh head of the beast. This counterfeit empire is the one which is mortally wounded and becomes the eighth head which Jesus will eventually cast into the lake of fire when he returns at the second coming. The seventh becomes an eighth because the first counterfeit empire started. It started with a man, not in back in B.C., okay, but in, six, in the 600s A.D., and it lasted all the way until 1924, 1924. It was actually, there was a period between 1917 and 1924, you know, the First World War uh, from 17 to 24, that period in which uh, this, it suffered its deadly head wound. But it was officially mortally, mortally wounded. It came to an end in 1924. We're talking about almost, a, we're talking about in the 100 year time time range, time frame here. Uh, and up until that time, our deceiver, Satan, his strategy in trying to destroy the seed of the woman by using individuals, uh, you know, start out with, well, Cain killed Abel, so he, he started out trying to, you know, use individuals. Then he went to using kings, uh, princes, uh, pharaohs, well, that failed, and, he, and nations, and then he, he tried nations and, you know, invading one another, that failed, uh, and that, what that does is it leads me to believe that, that what he did was he then devised a plan after he failed at the crucifixion by trying to turn it upside down an entire, God's entire uh, system of Judaism, uh, religion, okay, he tried to, to actually use God's own religion, Judaism, his own people, uh, to, to turn against their Messiah. Well, that failed, okay? He must have really been excited. He must have really thought that he had, that he would hope, he, he hoped that he would have succeeded there. But, you know, I, I want you to look at how Satan went about this in the past, okay? Uh, because here's where it gets kind of interesting. 
I've compiled, I compiled a list. I spent a time, some time looking at this, and that, this may cover most of it. I'm sure it probably doesn't cover all of it. But Satan had Cain kill Abel. And then the race became all evil. Well, I mean, how'd that happen? Well, that was the work of Satan. And then God brought about the flood. And he must, Satan must have rocked the ark. I mean, he must have rocked it pretty bad. I don't know how many of them got seasick, but he was trying to get rid of the race that would bring the seed of the woman. And then there's Esau. There's Esau who went about seeking to kill Jacob. And so Jacob's mother had him flee. Uh, Esau's anger he, it sort of abated later on, but, but for a moment he was trying to kill Jacob. And then there were Joseph's brothers who managed to work around with, with the you know, conniving, uh, uh, colluding or whatever with, with Satan to get rid of Joseph, and they thought that they were rid of him. And then when Joseph got to Egypt... He was falsely accused, absolutely innocent, thrown into prison, would have died, if, in fact, if God hadn't led Pharaoh to have a dream that needed to be interpreted. Then there was Pharaoh who killed all the male children of the Jews. Uh, you know, and, and I've often said, you know, Hitler... You know, here, here, here comes Hitler. He's trying to kill all the Jews. Well, if he had just killed all the male kids, you'd be rid of him in no time. You know, you kill all the male kids, it won't be that long. You know, 80 years or whatever, and then they're gone. They're all gone. So that's, that's what Pharaoh tried to do, and that didn't work. And then Saul tries to kill David. David. David was a man after God's own heart. And it was the seed of David that was going to rule in the kingdom. So Satan had Saul try to kill David. And that didn't work. You know, he threw a spear at him and missed. And it's amazing he, the spear missed. Saul was great in battle, but the spear missed. But, uh, I don't know, maybe some angel shoved him out of the way. But God was certainly looking out for him. And then we have, uh, and I, I don't know if I'm even pronouncing it right, uh, Joaquin, or however you want to pronounce it, where Satan won a great victory. You know, not, not a single seed of God will ever reign on the throne of Israel. He's done it. He thinks he's done it. He's cut the line off. He must have been absolutely thrilled. But just to make sure, he had Haman plot to kill all the Jews. And then, and then he goes, and then he had Herod, you know, plot to kill all the babies. I mean, relentless. But, you know, you go down through here, you look at this, it's just, you see what a loser this guy is. Nothing he, he tries succeeds. But I, I want you to look at the methods, the means of which he used, okay, to do this. So it goes right down to the, you know, uh, descended of David through another line. Mary was a virgin, and Joseph adopted Christ legally. It was a legal adoption. So here, here we have one who's not defiled by the curse, where the last legal inheritor of the throne of Israel, Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem of Judea. You know, not, none of their other... Jesus had, had brothers, half-brothers or whatever. But, but none of those, uh, none of the other children could be heir because of Joseph who was cursed. And, uh, and one day, and I believe soon, the experts in Israel are going to have to face the fact that the only legal descendant from David is Jesus Christ. You know, it must have been the crucifixion. That was the great heyday for Satan, you know. And, but we know how that worked out. And then, of course, Hitler, he tries to annihilate the Jews. That didn't work out, even though you know, he got over, I think, six million of them, but terrible period in Israel's history. 
And then we have the nations today. Even our own country, uh, I'm, I'm referring to the United States, which has been a supporter of Israel, is really beginning to weaken in that area. Uh, and it will not be long until Israel is hated of all nations. All nations. I want you to think, why would Israel be hated of all nations? And once again, Satan is going to say that he's conquered. Dearly beloved, you need to understand that that conflict is still here. You face it every day. And I face it every day. And then the regrettable thing is most Christians don't realize it. It's in the flat tire. It's in the destroyed transmission. It's in the spouse that left you. It's in the loss of a loved one. It's the loss of a job, a friend, losing a friend, losing a loved one. It's in, it's in health problems, uh, cancer, uh, you name it. They're there every day. They're not part of the glory of heaven and the perfection of God. We look at it as, you know, well, you know, if I just bought new tires sooner, I wouldn't have had a flat. You know, if I changed the tire, you know, we always come up with excuses and we never seem to realize that we're engaged in a warfare. And what Satan wants you and me to do is doubt God. And the question always seems to be, why does it have to be me? You know, we're in a spiritual battle and Satan's going to do what he can to get you to doubt God and not trust Him and not rest in Him. But I want you to ask yourself, what was it that set apart all Satan's former attempts to destroy God's plan and purposes with what we are seeing him do here now in Revelation? different than all those former attempts to destroy the seed of the woman, including corrupting Judaism itself to help him destroy the promised Messiah. We see that when corrupting Judaism fails, okay, the A.D. period of human history, there's a crossover now here, sees him inventing this monotheistic, counterfeit religion to Christianity, which I don't want to name for fear of being banned by some algorithm, this video to be taken down because of it's offensive. Satan realized that neither individuals or kings or nations or, or, or other religions, Judaism could succeed which then led to the formation of the church in which his attacks on the church then failed, leading him to abandon, I believe, this is just my opinion, <coughs> excuse me, get a little worked up on this, just leads him to abandon all those former tactics of inventing hundreds of pagan gods. That's what he did. Replacing that, maybe he finally got smart or he thought he got smart but he dumps all of the pagan got through this one founder of this counterfeit okay he dumps all the hundreds of pagan gods replacing that with what a monotheistic one god only strategy which copied the original okay which promoted a counterfeit religion that's exactly what its founder did Kind of makes you wonder what took him so long to figure that out. You know, he ma we know he masquerades as an angel of light. So he says, now there is now only one one God, and this is his name, and this is his this guy here. He's his messenger, folks. The man took the Bible and he turned it on on its head. He restructured it in such a way where that. This counterfeit would appear to be the one religion of the one true God, okay? Marking our God, Christ, the only way, the truth in the life, as the counterfeit. Now he's the counterfeit, okay? It, what, what really gets my go, get, gets me going here about this is that 
we see this same reversal upside down, turn it around, put the cart before the horse, twist, distort, pervert, corrupt thing going on today in culture, politics, religion, the whole works. Okay, folks, it's all messed up. Okay, why? Because our enemy, Satan, has, has blasphemed God to the point the very word blasphemy means to take and, and, and call good evil and evil good. Okay? It's, that's the meaning of the term. So we're now the counterfeit. Sound familiar? You've been watching the news lately? We are the counterfeit. So, but this, this counterfeit is seen as the good guy. You know, the true God's the bad guy. And what I find striking about this reversal is that it is exactly what we see taking place in the revelation of Jesus Christ to John. You know, masquerade as God himself Okay, rather than promoting hundreds of pagan gods, which really didn't have any real success in defeating God. Okay, so following the dictates of the this counterfeit, the goal of this counterfeit restruct reorg this counterfeit, I'll just I'll just say it caliphate. All right was to convert the entire, entire planet to this counterfeit. Through what means? Submission. Okay? And that's not them asking politely. You know, verbal in invitation at first, but, you know, and then, and then it, but if turned down, well then, you know, Folks, you got to look at history. The Muslim armies, and there I said it, probably shouldn't have. The, the, they invaded Europe. They pushed their way west all the way to France. And the decisive battle that stopped them, okay, from a total, complete takeover of Europe and the, and the destruction of the Christian faith was the battle that took place in the 700s in France. But that, that the tide was turned of that invasion, okay? Which before that, it, it had been practically unstoppable. Then in 1924, the British dealt this mortal wound to the seventh head of the beast when it took down the Turkish Ottoman Empire. That's history. It dismantled the caliphate and the office of the caliph and this counterfeit was without both for the first time in 1400 years it was without it okay and after that turkey became a republic instead of an empire okay folks we're not talking about the vatican we're not talking about the pope we're not talking about obama okay or henry kissinger you know i remember back you know some time ago, and you know, you know, the Antichrist is Henry Kissinger. I even remember some people claiming that he was Ronald Reagan. I mean, folks, come on, you don't think. Okay. And I guess, again, I'll, I'll go back to the question you know, well, why do we need to understand all this? Why do we need to know this? We're not going to be here, Steve. Why, why do we have to? That is true, we're not going to be here. I'm going to just let you stew on that for a while. I'm going to let you think about why God would have us understand this, particularly given the fact that we're not going to be here. Chapter 13 is, is, is really fascinating. There's, there's a, they had this, this, this counterfeit. It had, I don't know if it's still on the screen here. It had seven caliphates the last being the ottoman 
Caliphate, which wounded the beast to death. The, the, the seventh head of the beast at some point in our near future, which I don't think it will be long, will be revived if it's not already being revived at the, at the present time. And that's what's thrown in, into the lake of fire by Christ when he returns. Just look at Micah chapter 5, which refers to the, the, the Antichrist as the Assyrian, okay? Arabs, they're all descended from Ishmael. And it was God who prophesied of Ishmael and his, his children that their hands shall be against every man early on in Genesis. So this counterfeit will now be the, the dominant religion on earth. They will worship this system. They'll say, what empire is greater and who can stand against it? it it'll be the seventh head of the beast, which appears in Revelation uh, chapters 13 and 17. That was mortally wounded in 1924 which revives in the near future, if it isn't already in the process, you know, you, you think of this, the deadly wound was healed. Well, is that, is that an event or a process? A single event that occurs in a moment of time, or is it a process? I'm more inclined to think it's a process. The dream that King, most of you know, the dream that King Neb, Nebuchadnezzar, he had in Daniel chapter 2 is similar to the vision of the beast that John uh, had here. He dreamed of a statue with a head of gold, chest, arms of silver, a belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and, and the ten toes were mixed with iron and clay. These defer, these, all of these metals and body parts represent empires, according to Daniel 2. I, you know, I could, I don't want to do it. I, I could just park here in chapter 13 and spend three or four videos talking more about this, but I just don't, my stomach is not into it, folks. And, and I'm not one to skip over major portions of scripture. It's just that, but if I, I thought it, if I could just give you enough evidence to lean begin start starting to start to lean in in the right direction here rather than the wrong direction which in which there's no benefit at all whatsoever i'm not i don't know what benefit god is going to you know how he's going to particularly work uh, this revelation here in chapter 13 into your life i do know that that what he desires above all else is that we trust him he wants you to rest in Christ. He desires, greatly desires that you have the joy and the peace and the rest that is associated with trusting in Him. There's something really interesting about uh, Torah calendar's birth date for the Messiah being September 11. I pointed this out in num numerous videos. I've put that date block up on the screen for all to see you know it's september 11 and, and i i researched that heavily in the past and i saw there was some really strong evidence for that being the correct birth date it all based upon the pregnancy of elizabeth the timing the the month the seasons and so on and so forth which actually led me to to look back at the 271 days of average human pregnancy where it went back to Jesus being conceived during Hanukkah, which is kind of exciting. I do know and believe, uh, I'll just say I believe, I believe that we entered a, in a new phase in human history on September 11, 2001. And that that, that new phase was primarily associated with what we're looking at here. And I, I could see Satan giving our Lord a birthday present on 9-11. Well, look, I'm out of time. 
I did want to put this up here for those of you who don't watch the Super Bowl or for those of you who do and, and want something else to watch alongside it. I love you all. I truly do. And I want to thank you for all your continued prayers for my health. Uh, I'm not ready to talk about uh, specifically about what's going on there. It's um, I, I do ask continually for your prayers for that and the direction of this ministry. I want to thank you all, all of you sincerely for your interest and continued support of this ministry, as well as thank you for your comments, your kind, warm comments that you leave on YouTube. Until next time, this is Steve. Rest in Him. And thanks for watching.